This is Jocko Podcast number 136 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? Wherefore rock they purgatorial shadows drooping tongues from jaws that slob their relish bearing teeth that leer like skulls teeth wicked Stroke on stroke of pain But what slow panic gouged these chasms round their fretted sockets Ever from their hair and through their hands, palms, misery swelters. Surely we have perished sleeping and walk in hell. But who these hellish? These are men whose minds the dead have ravished. Memory fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed. Waiting slews of flesh, these helpless wander, treading blood from lungs that had loved laughter. Always they must see these things and hear them. Batter of guns and shatter of flying muscles. Carnage incomparable and human squander. Rucks too thick for these men's extrication. Therefore, still, their eyeballs shrink tormented back into their brains. Because on their sense, sunlight seems a blood smear. Night comes blood black. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Thus, their heads wear this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness of set smiling corpses. Thus their hands are plucking at each other, picking out rope counts of their scourging. Snatching after us who smote them. Brother, pawing us who dealt them war and madness. And that is a poem. It's a poem called Mental Cases. And it's a poem that was written by Wilfred Owen. He wrote it in 1918. He was a British poet, but he was also a British soldier. And he was wounded. In the First World War, he was blown up by a trench mortar. And then he spent several days unconscious, lying with the shredded remains of one of his fellow officers. And with those wounds, he was also diagnosed with shell shock. And he was sent to a place called Craig Lockhart Hospital, which is where they sent these soldiers to be treated and there he recovered to some extent and then he went back to the front and on October 1st in 1918 he led a unit from the second Manchester's as they assaulted enemy positions in John Court 
and he was awarded the military cross for that action and on the 4th of November 1918 seven days prior to November 11th which was the end of the war Wilfred Owen was killed in action he was shot by a German machine gunner and that poem is obviously about the psychological damage that he saw when he was in Craig Lockhart recovering from shell shock and I've talked about World War one on this podcast before and I've talked about the the shell shock and if you go to YouTube and you Google World War one shell shock and you watch some of the videos you can see the horror of the shell shock which reflects the horror of the war itself The trenches, the wounds, the gas, the death, the madness of the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of deaths over and over and over again. And that poem, Mental Cases, it reflects the nightmare of the shell shock inside the nightmare of this war and I wanted to hear a little bit about what shell shock looked like from the outside and I found an article called shell shock revisited an examination of the case records of the National Hospital in London by Stephanie Linden and Edgar Jones and they had some good excerpts coming directly from doctors, nurses that, that worked in these wards. And here's one. This is a case from the case of a 27-year-old rifleman known as Frank D., who was diagnosed with functional tremor and neurosis like dog chorea. And if you don't know what that is, it's a disease that gives dogs seizures and tremors and fits. And if you again go to YouTube you can see these dogs suffering like that and this is the what the doctors wrote about Frank D patient is a territorial which is a reservist who served heavily in World War one patient is a territorial and went out to France in January he has been quite well up to a week ago when on April 26th he was buried under a bomb explosion in the trench he was not unconscious but dazed and all in a tremble all his limbs were shaking he was conscious being carried by his comrades out of the trenches to a dugout a few hours afterwards he had to cry and he was crying for two days at the same time his arms began to twitch very frequently at first he was transferred to the 12th general hospital and from there to here Another case, another entry about a 23-year-old Scottish private known as Henry N. Henry M. from the 18th Hussars, who is diagnosed with functional facial spasm. On May t- May 13th, and this is 1915, patient was struck by several pieces of shrapnel on the right hand forearm shoulder and on the right side of the nose at its base he was very dazed but did not lose consciousness the wounds healed in a month about a week after being wounded he was operated on in order that a piece of shrapnel might be removed from his face on recovering from the anesthesia he found himself unable to move the right side of his face or open his mouth this condition which is quite painless has persisted since and he has not eaten solid food or been able to take out his false teeth he has been fed through a rubber tube inserted between his teeth in all other respects he feels well patient sits up in bed gasping in a highly alarming manner with his left face in a strong tonic spasm and his jaws tightly set all efforts to open his mouth are unavailing so strong is the contraction of his masseters he declares himself unable to breathe unless sitting up 
and when made to lie down, his neck is strongly retracted and set, and he breathes violently through his clenched teeth and holds his breath for as long as he can, assuming a purple tinge, which is apt to be disconcerting until one is accustomed to it. By the moral aid given by strong ferradism, which is an electric current applied by the physician, and force applied to the jaw, it is it was possible to remove a filthy set of false teeth. During this performance, he uttered piercing shrieks and foamed, and his rigidly held arms shook violently. Tears ran from his eyes, and he sweated profusely from his muscular exertion in resisting the attentions, well-intended though they were, of the physician. When asked to close his eyes, he was able to do. In fact, the left eye is half closed in spasm. All tests reveal good power in both sides of the face. The facial and jaw spasm would seem to be voluntary and due to frank malingering. In the intervals of this grotesque performance, he lies back on the pillow without any dysponia, but he induces an apparent difficulty in breathing at will. Examinations reveal no organic or injury in either nervous or other systems. So just to recap, they're, they're stating that the facial and jaw spasms would seem to be from voluntary and f- from malingering, basically saying that he's doing this so that he can avoid the war. Here's another different type of symptom of shell shock. This is a 23-year-old private named Albert R. And it's reported that he had marked twitching of the face and the whole body at times trembles. He looks ill and regurgitates wind. He complains of a peculiar feeling of worms growing in the lower part of the abdomen. He coughs considerably and said that his stomach swells up. A lump appears in his throat which chokes him and he is continually expectorating. The nights are particularly hard on him. He sits up in bed and has great difficulty breathing, cannot lie down properly, but lies over to one side, either left or right, puts his hand up to hold his head still from shaking. He has a depressed and sullen look. There are involuntary movements characterized by a very fine tremor manifested when his hands are spread out and his fingers are separated. There is a slight tremor in his legs of the same nature as appears in the other part of the body. So those are some examples of this this horrible affliction of shell shock and as you noticed in some of these, in, in that one right up in particular, there was people that were saying, oh, they're just faking this. They, they could overcome this if they would be braver. Some people did recognize that this was a serious issue and that this was a new kind of wound in a new kind of war in November of 1914. So this is pretty early on. November 1914, Lord Nutsford chairman of the London Hospital House Committee wrote an appeal that was published in London newspapers and here's what he wrote there are a certain number of our gallant soldiers for whom no proper provision is at present obtainable but is sorely needed they are suffering from very severe mental and nervous shock due to exposure excessive strain and tension They can be cured if only they receive proper attention from the physicians who have made a specialty of treating such conditions. These men are quite unsuitable patients for general hospitals as their chance of recovery depends on absolute quiet and on the individual and prolonged attention of the physician. If not cured, these men will drift back to the world as wrecks and miserable wrecks for the rest of their lives. So there, there were some people that recognized this was a, a, a factor that went well beyond the bravery of the individual. But unfortunately, 
that was probably less percentage of people. Most, most people thought that these individuals that suffered this affliction of shell shock thought that they were just, they, they, were, they weren't brave. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've, we've talked about it with a bunch of podcasts. Dick Winters talks about it. Hackworth talks about it, that there's a cup that gets filled, and if it gets filled too much, people can't take anymore. It's not because they're not good people. It's not because they, they aren't brave or they weren't brave. It's just that they're done. They're done. And there's ways you can treat them. We've talked about it before. You see a guy that looks like he's going to be done. You need to get him rest. And if they get rest, they can recover. If they don't get rest and they just get continually put into it, you're going to burn that engine out. You're going to burn out their brain. Well, they didn't quite understand that yet. And again, this type of warfare was totally new. There wasn't this kind of just continual slaughter ever before. And if it was, it was like an incident. Oh, there was a huge battle and there was a bunch of people killed. It wasn't like we're going to go do that again tomorrow. Well, guess what? These guys are going to go and do that same thing tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the day after that. So I want to talk about something that is as horrible as World War I was. This might be the most horrible part of World War I. And I know that's a bold statement, but I want to start by telling you the story of one individual soldier. His name was Harry Farr. And I'm going to go to a book about his life. The book is called He Was No Coward. It was written by Janet Booth and James White. And it tells the story of Harry Farr, the Harry Farr story. Now, it starts off by giving a little background on Harry Farr, and he grew up a young man, and it kind of starts off with him meeting who he would eventually marry, a woman by the name of Gertrude, and we'll go to the book. Gertrude and Harry started walking out together. They both loved visiting the Gaiety Theater, and many a happy evening was spent at the Hammersmith Empire watching the variety shows. The pair soon became girlfriend and boyfriend, and for the next four years, they became inseparable, but not without some bumps in the roads. At the age of 20, Harry was four years Gertrude's senior, something her family was not happy about. But what did she say? She said, I love him, I'm going with him, and that's that. So, they're young, they're in love, and Harry was earning good money working as a scaffolder on the building sites across London and it came as quite a shock in April 1913 when Gertrude realized she was pregnant a child born out of wedlock would bring shame and disgrace on the immediate family owing to the pending arrival of the baby they had to bring their wedding forward and were married as soon as possible by the time of the wedding they had been together for three years and they were married in Kensington Registry Office in the summer of 1913. A baby, who was to be their only child, was born on October 29th of that year. They named her Gertrude Nellie, her middle name after Harry's sister who had emigrated to America, but the new baby would be known affectionately as Little Gertie. Now, prior to meeting Gertie, Harry had, well, I'll go to the book. Harry had chosen an adventurous path, and in 1908, so this is previous, when he had just turned 18, he had decided to join the Army. He enlisted as a regular soldier in the 1st Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment, known as the Prince of Wales' own. Little is known of his two years as a regular soldier, but later records, records show he was considered to be a reliable and trustworthy soldier with an exemplary record of good behavior. Now, this happens in America as well when you're on active duty, which is what he was those first two years. When you get done with active duty, they put you on some sort of reserve status. There's, I think it's called IRR, and 
maybe it stands for immediate regular reserve I don't really remember I was on it for some amount of time but I don't remember and it's basically when you're out but they can recall you and then you can say active reserve which is when you're still getting paid maybe you should do some drills and whatnot it sounds like he was in a combination when he got out he was in a combination of those two we'll go to the book most soldiers who had left the army were automatically placed in the Section B Reserve. It meant that for five years they could be called upon in the event of general mobilization and were paid three shillings and six pence per week as a retainer, while also being obliged to undertake periodic training. So that's sort of like the reserves. I had to throw this in there in a pamphlet entitled A Short History of the West Yorkshire Regiment, the excitable introduction to the unit nicknamed the Old and Bold claims no regiment in the British Army has a more glorious history than the West Yorkshire Regiment, the Prince of Wales' own. For its record and gallant and devoted service to king and country in many parts of the empire is equaled by few and surpassed by none. So, proud history. And you can probably figure out where this is going. The war kicks off. World War I kicks off. And he gets recalled to go and serve. Back to the book, he had previously served with the regiment's 1st Battalion, but its soldiers were already in France when he returned to duty, so he joined the 2nd Battalion before his passage to France. Harry was granted a weekend pass, allowing him to return to London and spend a precious last few days with his wife and young child. Gertie's first birthday was celebrated that weekend, and Gertrude promised to write her husband frequently, as well as sending him food and clothing parcels after what must have been an extremely difficult farewell Harry returned to camp having slightly overstayed his pass subsequently being forced to forfeit four days pay like Harry the majority of his fellow comrades had never boarded a boat before let alone left England's shores despite reasonably smooth crossing to France many of the men suffered from seasickness Those not being sick were in good cheer and eager to face the enemy in battle, the general consensus of the men being that by Christmas, this bloody war will be over. So, it doesn't, it turns around pretty quick. Even in the book, that part turns around pretty quick, and obviously I skip some sections, but we get right into it. On November 13th at 11 p.m., the West Yorkshires relieved the Devon Regiment The very next day, the soldiers came under fire for the first time and suffered their first casualties with three men wounded. Indeed, one account of the battalion's first taste of trench warfare described the soldiers' great discomfort in heavy mud. At times during this period, the trenches occupied by the West Yorkshire Regiment soldiers were two to six feet deep in water, and cold mud baths were common so also was the inevitable accompaniment of sickness. On November 19th, the battalion lost its first man to sniper fire with another six wounded. Even when the men were resting in the barns and houses allocated behind to, the, to them behind the lines, there was no respite from the shelling. Acting Sergeant Walter Weston recorded the difficulty of fighting in the rapidly deteriorating conditions. He wrote, the continual rain where the whole terrain had turned into a quagmire of liquid mud, making it difficult for the transport carrying supplies and weapons to continue along the muddy roads. Every so often, they had to stop and push the vehicles over the cloying mud. Even more harrowing was to try to pull comrades out of the mud. Many perished by slipping off the duckboards and disappearing into the slime. The days spent in wet and muddy trenches left some soldiers incapacitated by trench foot and invariably resulted in many of the men having a foot or both feet amputated. The pitiful sight of the horses and mules stuck in the rain-sodden soil struggling to free themselves from the mud. So yeah, we think about trench foot, you know, think oh, your feet are uncomfortable or whatever. You don't think about having one or both of your feet amputated. Mm-hmm. December 18th, the West Yorkshire Regiment's colonel and captains were told that the 2nd Battalion Devon Regiment would be attacking the German trench and two companies of Yorkshiremen would be sent in support to dig and make good any captured trenches. The official battalion diary records the Devon attack commenced from the left and was late in starting. 
The right company never advanced, thus creating a block in the trenches. The left company's attack was unsuccessful owing to the wire arrangements. But the left center of company occupied 150 yards of the main German trench. At midnight, the entire 2nd Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment was ordered to take over the captured trench and improve it for defense while their comrades dug in alongside. However, at 8 a.m., the Germans responded with hand grenades thrown in great quantities and very rapidly, forcing the men occupying the trench to retreat to the British front line. As a consequence of this sudden action, the Company of West Yorkshire soldiers attempting to dig on the right were left exposed and suffered withering on filleted fire they also retreated and, and the attack ended in failure and the battalion suffered two officers killed two wounded and 120 other ranks killed or wounded almost all sustained in the retreat the new year and again i'm i'm advancing through the book and to get the full details get the book and read it the new year of 1915 began as the old one finished for the yorkshireman cold wet and in the trenches january 6 one man was killed and a lieutenant was taken to the hospital despite the hostile nature of the enemy just a few hundred yards in front of them the battalion ni- diary noted that the main cause of casualties was increasingly a result of sickness as well as via the ever-present water and mud, disease and sickness was carried by living sources from the lice that infested every bit of clothing to the rats that feasted on the unburied dead. Paul Fussell writes, the stench of rotten flesh was over everything, hardly repressed by, hardly repressed by the chloride of lime sprinkled on particularly offensive sites. Dead horses and dead men and parts of both were sometimes not buried for months and often simply became an element of parapets and trench walls. You could smell the line miles before you could see it. So if you've never smelled a dead body before, it's, it's an absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible smell. And when you think about the places where you're living are actually partially built from bodies and parts of bodies, it's hard to even imagine what the stench was and how bad it was. Back to the book. One man was killed and another wounded on January 12th. On January 19th, the trenches had dried out slightly and four men were injured in action. On January 25th, rifle fire was recorded as being heavier than usual, but ultimately the expected attack never came, though three men were killed in the course of the day. The following day was off to the billets in La Flinque, this time in the Brigade Reserve. Two men were killed and one wounded, but a draft of 50 men arrived. On the last day of the month, snow fell with water building in the trenches, but the enemy was quiet. The whole month of January had been spent either in the trenches or in the nearby reserve with no time spent any distance away from the guns. On February 4th, the battalion relieved 2nd Battalion. Four men were killed and five were wounded. On February 10th, the battalion was back in the line, losing one man and two wounded on February 11th. March 6th, five men were injured. Some severely, when they hit, they were hit by shrapnel in the morning, two of the five died of their wounds later that day. It's weird. You think about this. It's just pecking away. It's just pecking away day after day after day after day. You know, you got got 250 guys or something in your company, maybe 200 guys in your company, and it's two here. It's three there. It's eight wounded there. It's four wounded there. And then you get get, uh, drafts come in, which is new, fresh guys, 50 of them coming in to replace the guys that you've lost. 
officers were issued with a full set of orders on March 9th for the attack on Nouvelle Chapelle. March 10th at 7.30 a.m., the bombardment of enemy positions began with wire cutting shrapnel to aid any breakthroughs by the infantry. The first shell to fall was fired by an impressive 15 inch howitzer and weighed an incredible 1,400 pounds. However, their advance was blocked. The battalion then withdrew back to British trenches and held the line. Casualties had been severe as they had crossed, as they had across the front on the murderous first day of the battle. 23 members of the battalion were dead. 51 men had been wounded. Three were missing. But the savage fighting was to continue. At 4 a.m. the next day, orders received to move. 17 members of the regiment were killed outright. 40 men and one officer were wounded. Four men were missing. Shelling continued, inflicting heavy casualties on the severely depleted West Yorkshiremen as they huddled in the trenches in cold and misty conditions. By this stage of the attack, the infantry soldiers were exhausted. Dead on their feet would have been an accurate description. The condition of the gallant fellows who had been fighting and marching to and from the trenches since the early hours of the 10th with practically no respite was now pitiable. Men fell asleep at every halt, having to be roused by violent means. Among the ranks, 14 men were killed, 31 wounded, 6 went as missing. At 7 p.m., the soldiers moved off and occupied a line of trenches. Grimly, the battalion diarist noted, we found this trench unoccupied and full of dead. The deaths and injuries continued. Four were killed, 28 wounded, three went missing during the day. November 5th, General Haig, who was to become the commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force the following year, wrote in his diary, that why my one thought was how soon I could get my battle-worn troops relieved and given a few days rest out of the trenches and shell fire. On July 30th, 1915, he was even more explicit, saying, one lesson of this war was that troops could stand four days hard fighting and then must be relieved. So you take that right there. You take four days. That That's an average from this guy that's seen these folks on the front line. So that means there's people that are less than that. There's some people that are more. Some people can handle eight days, ten days. Some people can handle one day. Some people can't handle any. The average is four days. And here are these guys on the line for 10, 20, 13, 17 days at a time. And there is times that I'm not mentioning where they're they're going back off the front line and they're getting a little bit of recovery, but then they're going right back in. And it's not four days that they're going into for. They're going in for eight days, for 12 days. Back to the book. There was a little action with two men killed and one wounded. The battalion was relieved by the 2nd Battalion, Lincoln Regiment, and marched to billets just a mile away from the battleground. The 2nd Battalion had lost more than a quarter of its strength. March 18th dawned cold and wet, and despite the battalion diarist noting that it was quiet, three men were killed. Quiet day, three men were killed. April 6th, the shell exploded in a company billet, killing three and injuring eight. 5 a.m. on May 9th, the artillery bombardment of the enemy trenches began with the attack launched just 40 minutes later. So here we are on another attack. On another attack. During the shelling and small arms fire from the Germans, there were three were killed, 13 were wounded, and three posted as missing. And this results in the French attack on Vimy Ridge failed after a week, costing the French 100,000 casualties. The British attack on Aubers Ridge, which is what they were working on, failed ignominiously. So that's the life. 
if you can call it that. And here's where we start to hear a little bit about Harry. By this time, Harry had been withdrawn from the front line, suffering from what was becoming known as shell shock. He was taken off duty on May 9th. However, rather than being viewed as a psychological condition, some doctors and researchers were viewing the symptoms more in line with a neurological disorder or the result of a concussion from shell blast. Treatment for the condition largely involved rest away from the front line and possibly some talking therapies that we would now refer to as counseling. Some doctors utilized electric shock therapy and isolation therapy on sufferers, but both were unproven and experimental. And there's a Dr. Stevenson that says, post-traumatic stress disorder, this is looking back, post-traumatic stress disorder was exacerbated by the special conditions of static warfare in which soldiers endured repeated bombardments in confined spaces with little control over their fate and lived day by day in close proximity to their comrades' decomposing remains. So I've talked about this before. We talked about it when Jordan was on with Jordan Peterson. When you don't have any control, when you're not on offense, it, it's a lot harder to deal with psychologically. And this is the ultimate mm. defensive. You're just gonna get bombed and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. And by the way, you're gonna watch your friends and your comrades get wounded and killed every single day. Back to the book. In the summer of 1915, Gertrude received a letter from France, but she did not recognize the handwriting on the envelope as Harry's. So his wife gets a letter. She doesn't recognize the handwriting. The letter stated that Harry was ill and in the hospital. He had been evacuated from the Hooplins area in May as he had been suffering from what was known as shell shock. Stricken by nervous exhaustion, his hands had been shaking too much to hold a pencil, so a nurse at the hospital had written the letter for him. Again, uncontrollable shaking is what these guys are experiencing. So bad he can't write his letter, a letter to his wife. After the extended period behind the lines, Harry was assessed and certified fit. He was sent back to the West Yorkshire Regiment, this time joining the 1st Battalion, part of the 18th Infantry Brigade, 6th Division in October of 1915. On October 21st, 89 men, including Harry, joined the battalion while it was camped behind the line. Shortly after, the Germans launched a huge barrage against Allied rest areas along all the front in in retaliation for Royal Artillery shelling of their own billets. Although little damage was done, the sound of the guns, which had caused Harry to fall ill before, had begun all over again for him. At the end of the month, the battalion began an 11-day spell in the trenches characterized by heavy rain, collapsing fortifications, and mud. By November 3rd, an officer had been killed, and almost all dugouts had collapsed, leaving men with little respite from the appalling weather. On December 5th, the battalion marched to Everling, spending the next 10 days forming working parties to carry out tasks such as repairing paths. Despite not being in the line, casualties were sustained when the parties were shelled and fired upon by riflemen. So even when you go back to the rear, you're still getting shot and killed. December 19th, when the area came under artillery bombardment and that frightening phenomenon of battle, the use of gas. The action began at 5.30 a.m. when the British-held trenches came under heavy rifle fire. Then at 6.45 a.m. when troops were stood to in anticipation for an attack, shells containing gas were fired by the Germans. The effect of the gas was instantaneous and horrifying. During the day, 11 men died and 23 were wounded, two suffering the effects of gas. Total Allied losses on the day as a reduction direct result of gas were 1,069 casualties and 69 deaths. The battalion was back in the trenches for the end of the year and the start of the new one on December 30th. The battalion's headquarters were shelled, suffering two men killed and four injured. 
On February 14th, German artillery shells fell again in the battalion, killing five and injuring 15. By the time the 1st Battalion left the trenches the next evening, it had suffered the losses of nine killed and 51 injured. It underscores the losses suffered by the British Army during the First World War when 7,000 soldiers were killed and wounded every day as a matter of course. 7,000 a day. March 17th, as they marched the four miles to begin a period of rest that was to last a month, two men were killed and three men were wounded. How the soldiers were afflicted is not recorded. And it's first spelled back in the trenches, so they go get some rest. Now it's coming back, and the first spell back in the trenches. After a month away from the line, five were wounded and five killed. During April, Harry reported sick with nerves and was treated at a dressing station for two weeks before returning to frontline duty. His problems were worsening. Yet the fact he was not sent far behind the lines suggests medical officers did not deem him sick enough to be evacuated. June 3rd. Another operation. Losses during the operation were heavy, with one officer and five sergeants killed, as well as five other ranks. Two sergeants and 24 other ranks were wounded, a total casualty rate of about 17%. On July 1st, less than 100 miles south of their position, following a week in which 1.6 million shells were fired, British forces attacked en masse on a 15 mile long front. The slaughter that ensued on the first day of the Battle of the Somme was prodigious, with almost 60,000 British casualties, a third of them dead. News of the slaughter took days to filter back to Britain, and thanks to heavy censorship of the press, the horrors of the battle were not truly expressed, but the casualty lists gave no lie to the situation. On July 15th, the West Yorkshires left camp and moved by train to Ypres, where they relieved the 11th Battalion. Harry again reported sick with nerves on July 22nd and was detained by medical corps soldiers for the day, but this time he was returned as fit for duty the next day. So this guy's falling apart. He keeps asking for help, and they keep sending him back to the front. And mind you, he's in a state, I mean, not all the time, but he's at least reaching a state where he can't even write a letter to his wife. Can't even steady his hand for that, and they're putting him back to the front over and over again. On August 6th, camp was broken, and the battalion marched. The battalion had joined the Battle of the Somme, infamous for the unprecedented British losses and intensity of the shelling operation. The next four days were spent in the Brigade Reserve, as before, with hundreds of men sent digging and carrying duties. This work proved more hazardous than the previous week, with four killed, nine wounded, one man missing, believed to have blown up. On September 11th, the battalion proceeded with the brigade to an area known as Sand Pits. The following day was spent with the brigade in reserve. In Six men were killed and four more were wounded among, amid a general British offensive across the sector involving the use of the latest weapon, tanks. On September 18th, the battalion joined other forces of 6th Division in attacking opposing trenches. At 5.50 a.m., whistles sounded along the line as soldiers poured up over the front trenches through previously cut barbed wire and and between breastworks. Companies were met with very heavy machine gun and rifle fire and were forced to retreat back from the trenches where the attack started from. The cost was shockingly high, with more than 100 casualties across the battalion, an attrition rate of more than 10%. Among the 13 dead were three officers. Almost 100 officers, almost 100 soldiers were wounded, including four officers. Later on September 19th, the exhausted soldiers made their way to billets eight miles away, where they remained overnight and the following day. The attack was considered a success, but Private Farr had not taken part in the operation. His final nervous collapse took place on September 17th. 
Harry had fallen out sick on September 16th, yet when he made his way to a dressing station the following day, he was not seen because he was not wounded. On September 17th, he was ordered to the front in the company of a rations party, but was found at 11 p.m. that night at the same place behind the lines, having disobeyed the order. When he was subsequently sent to the front under escort, he struggled with his guards and was released after refusing to see a medical officer further forward. Harry ran back towards the transport lines in the rear and was held under guard before being placed under arrest on September 18th and charged with cowardice. The timing of his collapse ahead of the impending attack may have helped along the decision to charge him. The Battle of the Somme resulted in the greatest loss of life in military history at the time for negligible gains. Across the whole offensive during that awful summer and autumn between July 1st and November 19th, the British Army suffered 420,000 casualties, the French 195,000, and the German losses stood between 500 and 650,000. So the massive fighting that was going on at the Battle of Somme is also reflected in the fact that they're being super hostile towards him. On October 2nd, 1916, Private Harry Farr stood trial by field general court-martial, which was convened at ville sur in France. Since his nervous collapse and arrest, his battalion had again been in action following their part in the success in the capture of the quadrilateral. This time, they had helped attack and take the village of Le Buffs on September 25th, part of the wider Battle of Morval. It was against this backdrop of missing two significant actions that Harry was tried. A field general court-martial was a wartime disciplinary tribunal with the, with the power to try all military offenses. So, obviously, you know, these guys are, are they're not looking to hear about your excuses of why you can't get after it with the rest of the troops and the rest of the troops are going forward the rest of the tr- I mean the rest of the troops are going forward and they're fighting and they're fighting hard and they're making incredible sacrifices something that he wasn't physically able to do at this point he was he had lost it he had seen too much he had done too much and he was done so they're sending him to court martial Harry was charged with an offense contrary to Section 4, 7 of the Army Act of 1881. The exact charge was misbehaving before the enemy in such a manner as to show cowardice, to which he pleaded not guilty. He Harry appeared without a prisoner's friend, so there was there wasn't no there was no like lawyer to defend him. It was just him. Just him. Assessing the overall situation, Captain Whitlow said, I cannot say what has destroyed this man's nerves, but he has proved himself on many occasions incapable of keeping his head in action and likely to cause a panic. However, the officer made a point of differentiating between these problems and the unfortunate soldier's nature, saying, apart from his behavior, his conduct and character are very good. So he's got one person that comes forward and says, hey, he's not a bad guy. He's just, he's just lost it right now. Because he did a, a, a fair amount of fighting. The next piece of evidence was signed by W. William, the battalion's medical officer. He wrote, I hereby certify that I examined Private Harry Farr, 1st Battalion, Yorks, on October 2nd, 1916, and that, in my opinion, both the general physical and mental condition were satisfactory. Interestingly, the word good appears before the word satisfactory, but is struck out by the same hand, indicating some doubts in the officer's mind. The trial began formally with a prosecution witness, Regimental Sergeant, Sergeant Major H. Laking, who said on 17th September 1916, about 9 a.m., the accused reported himself to me at A-Line Transport. 
He states that he was sick and had fallen out from the company the night previous on the march up to the trenches. He states he could not find his company commander for permission to fall out. I order him to report to the dressing station. When he returns, he states that he, they would not see him and as he was not wounded. I then order him to proceed to the battalion with the ration party, which was going in the evening. The ration party paraded about 8 p.m. The accused was present and marched off with it. On the arrival at the ration dump, Company Quartermaster Sergeant Booth reported to me that the accused was missing. On returning to the first line for about 11 p.m., I saw the accused standing near a brazier. I asked him why he was there. He replies, I cannot stand it. I asked him what he meant. He again replies, I cannot stand it. I told him he would have to go to the trenches that night. He replies, I cannot go. I order Company Quartermaster Sergeant Booth to take him up to the trenches under escort. After going 500 yards, the accused commences to scream and struggle with his escort. I again warned him that he would have to go to the trenches or be tried for cowardice. He replied, I am not fit to go to the trenches. I then said I would take him to see a medical officer. He refused to go, saying, I will not go any further that way. I ordered the escort to take him on. The accused started again struggling and screaming. So they actually want to take him to a medical officer that's further forward, and he's not going. Mm. He's done. The second witness to be called was Company Quartermaster Sergeant J.W. Booth of the 1st Battalion West Yorkshire Regiment. And he says, on September 17th, 1916, about 3 p.m., I ordered the accused to parade with the carrying party at 6 p.m. to go up and join his company in the trenches. The accused paraded and marched off with the ration party. On arrival at the ration dump, the accused was absent, having fallen out on the way without permission. About 9 p.m., I saw the accused near the first line transport. The regimental sergeant major ordered me to take the accused with the escort to the trenches. About 500 yards from the first line transport, the accused became violent, threatened the escort, and eventually broke away, returning to the first line transport. The regimental sergeant major ordered me to place the accused in charge of a guard. Those stories kind of line up. The third witness was Private D. Farrar, who also appears to have survived the war. He said, on September 17, 1916, about 11.30 p.m., I was ordered by Company Quartermaster Sergeant Booth to form part of an escort to take the accused up to his company in the trenches. After going about 500 yards, the accused started struggling and saying he wanted to see a doctor. The sergeant major said he would see one when he got a bit further up the accused refused to go any further i tried to pull him along the sergeant major told me to let him go and the accused went back to the first line transport so there's the perspective of the folks that were with private far and here is private far's defense this is what he had to say about the situation on 16th september 1916, when going up to the trenches with my company, I fell out sick. I could not find the company officer to obtain permission. The sergeant I asked has now been wounded. I went back to the first line transport, arriving there about 2 a.m. on 17 September 1916. I would have reported at once the regimental sergeant major, only I was told he was asleep. I reported about 9 a.m. on 17 September. The sergeant major told me to go to the advanced dressing station. They, however, would not see me as I was not wounded. The sergeant major told me to go up with the ration party at night. I started with this party and had to fall out sick. I could not get permission as I was in the rear and the sergeant major was in the front, but left word with a private soldier. I returned to the first line transport, hoping to report sick to some medical officer there. On the sergeant major's return, I reported to him and said I was sick and I could not stand it. He then said, you are a fucking coward and you will go to the trenches. I give fuck all for my life and I give fuck all for yours and you'll get fucking well shot. The sergeant major, company quartermaster Booth and private Farrar then took me toward the trenches. 
We went about a mile when we met a carrying party returning from uh, returning under Lance Corporal Form. The sergeant major asked Lance Corporal Form where I was, and he replied, "Run away, same as last night." I said to Sergeant Major, "You have got this all made up for me." The sergeant major then told Lance Corporal Form to fall out two men and take me to the trenches. They commenced to shove me. I told them not to as I was sick enough as it was. The sergeant major then grabbed my rifle and said, I'll blow your fucking brains out if you don't go. I then called out for an officer, but there was none. I was then tripped up and commenced to struggle. After this, I do not know what happened until I found myself back in the first line transport under a guard. If the escort had not started to shove me about, I would have gone up to the trenches. It was on account of their doing this that I commenced to struggle. After the statement, Harry was cross-examined by the court's prosecutor who asked if he had had the opportunity of reporting six since September 16th. Harry replied, yes, after I was put under arrest on 18 September. A member of the court-martial then asked why he had not reported sick since his first arrest, to which he replied, fatefully, because being away from the shell fire, I felt better. Evidence to as to the character of Private Farr was presented to the court. The battalion's adjutant, Lieutenant W. Paul, stated that he knew Harry for six weeks. He said on working parties, he has three times asked for leave to fall out and return to camp as he could not stand the noise of the artillery. He was trembling and did not appear to be in a fit state. So Harry had spent four years in the service of his country, two years before the war and two years during it. The private soldier took part in a number of actions with his infantry battalion, most notably the Battle of Nueve Chapelle. It was one of the most intense and attritional chapters of the entire conflict on the Western Front, one of the first examples of the wholesale slaughter of British troops for which the First World War has become renowned. Within months, he was in the hospital, his nerves shattered with a diagnosis of shell shock. Yet he returned to the front in October of 1915 and fought on for another 11 months with two more spells of sickness because of his shell shock. According to Chris Walsh in Cowardice, A Brief History, as World War I dragged on, Captain Charles Wilson of the Royal Army Medical Corps observed fear was no longer an occasional and exotic vis- visitor, but a settler in our midst. Its cumulative effect led Wilson, later Lord Moran, which was Sir Winston Churchill's personal doctor, to think that a man's ability to hold up against it, his courage, was not absolute quality of his character, but something he had a certain amount of, like money in a bank account, and which could be depleted slowly or suddenly by the hardships and horrors of war. Harry Farr had reached the limit of his endurance and could go no further. And so the trial was over. There was no lawyer, no soldier's friend, no support. And there was no mercy. Back to the book. The wording on the charge sheet was stark. Under a column entitled, Finding and if convicted, sentence. Two words were handwritten in pencil. Guilty, death. There was no right to an appeal. In late 1916, a telegram arrived for Gertrude Farr from the war office. 
Opening the envelope with trembling hands and a thumping heart, she read the bold, typewritten message that realized her worst fears. Harry Farr had died in France, but not in battle or of wounds sustained under fire. Rereading it in disbelief, Gertrude learned that her husband had been executed by firing squad. The stark message read, we regret, we regret to inform you that Harry Thomas Farr of the 1st West Yorkshire Regiment has been shot for showing cowardice in the face of the enemy. Shot for showing cowardice in the face of the enemy. And unfortunately, he was not the only one. There were 351 men executed by the British Army during World War I, and more than 300 of those, just over 300 of those, were for their supposed cowardice. And there is a book called Shot at Dawn by Julian Putkowski and Julian Sykes. And it's called Shot at Dawn because that was generally when these executions were carried out. They were carried out in the, in the early morning. And it details some of those men. It actually details all the men and their deaths and provide some insight from some of the people that were there during these horrible times. So I'm going to go to that book. The first sentence of death imposed on a soldier of the BEF, which is the British Expeditionary Forces, was carried out in the fifth week of the war. And the condemned soldier was Private Thomas Highgate from Kent. He had been born in the little village of Shoreham near Seven Oaks, Seven Oaks, and had joined the army in February 1913. Like many who enlisted for regular army service, the lad had joined up at the age of 17. After less than two weeks in action, the private had deserted on the day that he went missing. His battalion had started to move northwards, advancing. Highgate, who was wearing civilian clothing, was discovered by a gamekeeper hiding in a barn. His uniform was concealed nearby. When questioned, he said, I want to get out of it, and this is how I'm going to do it. Not surprisingly, Private Highgate was found guilty. The sentence imposed was that he would suffer death by being shot. 17-year-old kid. In March 1915, two soldiers from one West Yorkshire regiment were convicted of desertion and then were shot within a few days of each other. The first, Lance Corporal Alfred Atkinson, deserted whilst in rest, the battalion being under orders to proceed to the front. In January of that year, Atkinson had won a sum of money gambling and after a bout of drinking, subsequently deserted. After three weeks, he was then arrested by the military police. At his trial, the court was told that Atkinson was a good soldier and previously of excellent character. As a result, his sentence bore a recommendation to mercy. A soldier serving with the battalion at the time later confirmed his opinion, saying that Atkinson was a clean, smart, brave soldier represented by all or respected by all his comrades. When General Sir Horace Smith Dorian reviewed the proceedings, he was of the opinion that an example was required. And the sentence was confirmed. And here's an eyewitness of an account. The two men, and this is Labor MP Ernst Thurdle. The two men I selected for the firing party went with the adjutant. When they came back, tough characters though they were supposed to be, they were sick. They screamed in their sleep. 
They vomited immediately after eating. All they could say was the sight was horrible, made more so by the fact that we had shot one of our own men. Private Abraham Beverstein was the only son of an East End family because it was considered dishonorable in certain Jewish circles to be a soldier. Beverstein had signed up under the false name of Harris. 1915 Christmas Eve, Private Beverstein was wounded in the back. He had he was admitted to the hospital suffering from these wounds and also from shock. In his letters home, Private Beverstein told of his progress in the hospital and that he'd been detained there since 19 January 1916 because he had developed a pressure sore on his heel. 1st January 1916, dear mother, I'm very sorry that I did not write before now, but we were in the trenches on Christmas Day and we had a lot to do. Also, I was taken ill and was sent to the hospital. I am feeling a little better, so don't get upset. Also, don't send any letters to the company because I won't get them. Also, you cannot send any letters to the hospital as I won't get them. Dear mother, do not worry. I will be all right. Hoping all of you are getting on well. I was only hurt in the back. I will try to send you letters every few days if I can to let you know how I am getting on. We get plenty of food in the hospital. Dear mother, I know it will break your heart this but don't be upset about it. I will be all right, but I would very much like to see you. I will try my very best. And he did recover. And he went back to the front. On 13 February, the soldier had left his position in the front line trenches and made his way to one of the company headquarters in the rear. He reported to his company quartermaster sergeant and stated that a grenade had burst very close to him and that he was suffering from shock believing him to be a nervous condition this nco told harris to report to the medical officer beverstein reported to the medical officer who examined him but found nothing wrong as a result the private was ordered to return to the trenches beverstein however did not obey but made his way to a farmhouse in the rear where he took refuge shortly thereafter whilst warming himself by a fire an officer from another regiment came into the farmhouse and suspecting that Beverstein was a deserter placed the lad under arrest the letter sent home indicated that Beverstein was in trouble but did not disclose the serious nature of his predicament clearly as a soldier did not realize that his life was at stake but the letters relate that at the time of his desertion the private had been feeling unwell 23 February 1916 dear mother we were in the trenches and I was ill so I went out and they took me to prison and I am in a bit of trouble now and I won't get any money for a long time I will have to go to the front go in front of a court I will try my best to get out of it so don't worry but dear mother try to send some money not very much but try your best I will let you know in my next how I got on give my best love to mother father and Kate your loving son Abby on March 4th when he was court-martialed private Beverstein explained that on the day of his absence a a grenade had exploded beside him and this had been more than his nerves could stand he added that he had then lost control the court was unimpressed by this story and in spite of an unblemished record the soldier was sentenced to death and the finding was confirmed by the commander-in-chief. Private Beverstein's parents were left unaware of their son's predicament. The next communication which they received came from the Army. It was an official Army form which carried a blunt message. Sir, I am directed to inform you that a report has been received from the War Office to the effect that Private Harris A, 11th Battalion, Middlesex Regiment, GS, was signed was sentenced after trial by court-martial to suffer death by being shot for desertion, and the sentence was duly executed on 20 March 1916. Another one, and again, this book is, is details every single soldier, you know, picking out some of, the, some of the ones that stood out a bit to me. The next soldier concerned was Rifleman Albert Parker, serving with seven Kings Royal rifle corps his crime was typical example of desertion committed with the intention of avoiding service in the line 35 year old Parker admitted drunkenness at his trial but this did not mitigate his offense an eyewitness later recalled the promulgation of sentence and the execution that followed then the prisoner's cap was taken off and he was told to take one pace forward which he did 
The APM commenced to read the papers. The man was then told to take a pace back again, which he did without a quiver. A braver man at that moment wasn't to be found in France. He was then marched away to the place where he was to be shot. We were then ordered to about turn and the brigade transport officer threatened us that any man who turned around would be put on a crime. So we stood in silence for what seemed hours, although only minutes. Then the shots rang out and one of the Yorkshires fainted. The strain was that great. Still we stood in silence until we heard another shot, which I afterwards ascertained was the doctor's shot to make sure he was dead. Private Phillips of one Coldstream Guards was executed for desertion. The clergyman who attended Private Phillips was Captain T. Guy Rogers, chaplain to the Second Guards Brigade. The clergyman documented his feelings in what he clearly regarded as a most harrowing ordeal. 31 May 1916, shall I tell you of the terrible experience I have just gone through? If so, it must not go beyond the family circle of yourself and the Haslams. It has just fallen to my lot to prepare a deserter for his death. That meant breaking the news to him, helping him with his last letters, passing the night with him on the straw in his cell, and trying to prepare his soul for meeting God. The execution and burying him immediately. The shadow was just hanging over me when I wrote the last letter, but I tried to keep it out. Monday night I was with him. Tuesday morning at 3.30 he was shot. He lay beside me for hours with his hand in mine. Poor fellow. It was a bad case, but he met his end bravely and drank in all I could teach him about God, his Father, Jesus, his Savior, and the reality of the forgiveness of sins. I feel shaken by it all, but my nerves, thank God, have not troubled me. Everyone has been so kind who knew of the ordeal. I will tell you some more some other time. I want to get it off and away from the thought of it as much as I can. Here's a few guys that deserted together in a group Lance Sergeant Joseph Stones Lance Corporal Peter Goggins and Lance Corporal John McDonald in the new year when Sir Douglas Haig came to review the sentences he commuted the those imposed on the four privates so there's four privates with these guys these guys were the leaders of this group that deserted which were suspended but an eyewitness account recorded the final moments of the three condemned NCOs shot on 18 January. Come out, you, ordered the corporal of the guard to me. I crawled forth. It was snowing heavily. Stand here, he said, pushing me between two sentries. Quick march. And away we went. Not as I dreaded to my first taste of pack drill, but out and up the long street to an R.E. dump. There, the police corporal handed in a chit, whereupon three posts, three ropes, and a spade were given to me to carry back. Our return journey took us past the guard room, up a short hill, until we reached the secluded spot surrounded by trees. Certain measurements were made in the snow, after which I was ordered to dig three holes as stipulated distances apart. I began to wonder, could it be? No, perhaps spies, perhaps, oh, perhaps, only my fancy. The next scene, a piercingly cold dawn. A crowd of brass hats, the medical officer, and three firing parties. Three stakes a few yards apart, and a ring of sentries around the woodland to keep the curious away. A motor ambulance arrives conveying the doomed men. Manacled and blindfolded, they are helped out and tied up to the stakes. Over each man's heart is placed an envelope. At the sign of command, the firing parties, 12 each, align their rifles on the envelopes. The officer in charge holds his stick aloft, and as it falls, 36 bullets 
usher the souls of three of Kishner's men to the great unknown. As a military prisoner, I helped clear the traces of the triple murder. I took the post down. I helped carry those bodies toward their last resting place. I collected all the blood-soaked straw and burnt it. Acting upon instructions, I took their belongings from the dead men's tunics, discarded before being shot. A few letters, a pipe, some fags, a photo. I could tell you of the silence of the military police after reading one letter from a little girl to Dear Daddy. Another. Private David Stevenson. When sensing danger, the soldier had run off. When questioned, the private had lied, saying that he was working for another town mayor. Un unfortunately for Stevenson, he was already under suspected suspended sentence for previous offense of desertion. The recollections of an ex-sergeant who had been in charge of the firing squad who shot Private Stevenson were published after the war. It was a terrible scene. Being that I knew him made it worse for me. The ten men were selected for the firing squad from a few details left out of the line. They were nervous wrecks themselves and two of them had not the nerve to fire. Of course, they were tried by court-martial but they were found to be medically unfit. Their nerves had gone. The last words the lad said were, what will my mother say? I have one more, and this was an interesting writing. There was a, a private named Private Frederick Butcher, and the report that comes out was actually published in a newspaper years after the execution but and and he calls the private frederick butcher he calls him jim but this eyewitness to his execution wrote about it in a paper i shall call him jim he had been out three years he had been wounded but he was wounded at a time when wounded were cared for in france and were back in the line in six weeks there was nothing about Jim which attracted special attention. He was the average happy-go-lucky sort of lad who did the day's work on an average, in the average way. War had become normal to him, and he had settled down to that fatalism which characterized so many of our men when they said, if it is to be, it will, and if it ain't, it won't. As if he had suddenly been hit in the mind he stood stock still t still one night and point blank refused to go over with a raiding party. In an instant, he became a marked man. His comrades could not quite determine whether it was bravery or idiocy. Perhaps some string had snapped. Some, something somewhere had gone wrong. But Jim just refused. He was exceedingly nervous, but such a breach of discipline was in itself sufficient to account for that. By the time he stood on the mat before the court, he had partly regained his normal composure, but the seriousness of the situation had washed away the color from his face, and there was a dull, leaden look in his blue eyes. His record saved him. It was good, and his judges tempered judgment with mercy and consideration. He had been many platoon. He had he had had many platoon commanders, many captains, and all and with all he had done his bit. The court gave him a chance. He made no excuse whatsoever. But when question, but when asked the question, he promised that it would not occur again. A week later. It did occur again, and the next court sentenced him to death. Blindfolded, with his hands tied behind him, he was to be shot at dawn the following day. From the death century, Jim learned the names of the officer and men who were to send him west next morning. They were all his friends. Two or three officers who had known him for years went into the death hut and said goodbye. Somehow none of them could quite catalog Jim as a coward. 
terrible things happen in war but nothing perhaps is more terrible than to send one of your own out of life when you're not quite sure whether he is a coward or a martyr the world will never know the real truth there was no psychologist there to give an opinion even if there had been it might not have altered the course of events discipline even then might have won an unfair victory over science in the mechanism of Jim Jim's mentality a cog slipped and the wheels revolved irregularly from what the CEO and Jim's pals told me I am fully persuaded that Jim died as a martyr to discipline Jim was blindfolded his hands were bound together behind him as he stood there calm and steady as a rock the orders were given goodbye sir goodbye boys he said just as if he were off on a 10-day furlough there was no reply the subaltern was choked with emotion and the firing squad as heart rent as he dared not reply the sharp crack of a volley smothered sighs of relief from the squad and all was over all save laying ben- him beneath the soil of France and there where Jim lies there shall remain forever a little bit of England well As I said, uh, this is a awful thing, and I'm sorry to have to bring it up, and I'm sorry to have to talk about it. I'm sorry that that we human beings are capable of this, and at the same time, it's good to know what we are capable of so that we can prevent it. And eventually, in 2006, after way too long and after a lot of effort and hard work by a lot of compassionate people, the British government admitted that it was wrong. And the story of that effort is retraced in the first book I read from He Was No Coward, and it resulted in the pardon of Harry Farr and of 306 of the other soldiers who were executed who were shot at dawn for the crime of having a psychological breakdown under the immense mental and physical trauma of World War One and in 2006 Harry Farr's daughter Gertie who he started this story off with Gertie was presented with a letter from the Secretary of Defense Desmond Brown which included the official pardon for Harry Farr and it reads this document records that private Harry Farr of the 1st Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment who is executed for cowardice on 18 October 1916 is pardoned under section 359 of the Armed Forces Act of 2006 the pardon stands as recognition that he was one of many victims of the First World War and that execution was not a fate he deserved Signed, Des Brown, Secretary of State for Defense. And so 
he was pardoned and I would say that Private Harry far we we beg your pardon and I would say let us learn something from this something about leadership and something about our behavior as human beings our nature as human beings let us learn something from the fate of Harry Farr and that is that we as human beings are not infallible we are not perfect and we will fall short of the ideals that we aspire to we'll fall short of those and we may not always be as bold and we may not always be as heroic and we may not always be as brave as we want but while we may fall short on those traits let us never fall short in compassion in sympathy and in understanding and let us when we look to judge others let us remember and let us know that our judgment is as imperfect as we are and remember that it is us who in the words of Wilfred Owens we are the ones that dealt them war and madness and so let us also be the ones who deal them mercy and forgiveness and I think that's all I've got for tonight so echo Charles Mm -hmm. kind of a rough one yeah odd it's like an odd feeling right just that even that that final part of that last book oh how you know you gotta essentially kill or witness or both your friend and even until that it's not like you guys are friends he betrays you no. you know and you're mad at him and then you kill him it's not that it's like yeah some other thing kind of happened meanwhile you're still friends and then you gotta be a part of in whatever way like right in front of his face too yeah like him dying and the kind where you're literally saying bye hey bye and then next moment dead yeah and yeah just kind of you know when you think you, you read these books you have this picture in your mind you know and it's just it's so off-putting just all the different facets that just come to play with a scenario like that and there, there's I mean obviously there's a there's a huge dichotomy in this there's a, the huge dichotomy in this is that there's all these millions of brave soldiers mm. that went that went over the top and they were killed and so how can you have any sympathy for the people that are like no I can't do it yeah. and and the answer is you've got to recognize that diff- people are different yeah and and you know it's interesting that that last guy calls him a martyr yeah. and the perspective that even someone that stood by him and someone that fought and took the same risks and could have been killed himself and happened to live yeah. he recognizes like hey it yeah this this happens and you know there's one part that kind of when you when I hear about this guy the one guy gets rolled up or gets caught by some guy that's patrolling around the rear looking for deserters it's like when I hear about that guy I can picture that guy <laughs> I can picture that guy yeah. he's in the rear saying oh you need to more breathe get 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 up to the front yeah. like I, you can picture that guy yeah. and that that kind of makes me angry yeah because you got somebody that's in the rear policing up people sending them to the front why aren't you up on the front yeah get up there yourself yeah. but yeah so there's a dichotomy to it 
in that you know you 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 I mean obviously you uphold and have the utmost respect for the bravery of the people that step up and and they're on put them on the I put them on the highest pedestal and then you've got these people that contradict that it, the, the, I think that the line gets drawn in the fact that these guys lose control they can't yeah. do it yeah they can't do it anymore they they mentally can't take it and again you know it's, this is the same thing that Dick Winters said the same thing that Hackworth said that guys reach a limit and they're done yeah. and only people that have been in extensive combat recognize that the people reach a point yeah. and there's there's that whole section in in Band of Brothers where they some of those guys that are total studs they, they, they can't go anymore yeah. they break down and Dick Winters is like okay we as a leader this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do my best to take care of them if they if we can get them recovered cool if not respect if not, hey, it's okay. You did what you could. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a it's a strange dichotomy. Yeah, and you can't help but to try to imagine, not necessarily the specific scenario, but like what it, what is it? How does it feel to literally like not be able to to do something? You know, like you. Yeah, well, you there's know, a, there's a lot of shame for these guys that that right. came home, and there was shame that they weren't wounded, they weren't physically wounded, and 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 the government treated them very badly in many cases yeah like oh you're cowards and so it's awful it's yeah. absolutely awful so I hate World War one I. I hate World War one yeah and that's a shoot that's the thing too it's not like you know they're taking a spin class and they quit halfway through because they were too tired or something like that this is no echo you are correct they were not in the spin <laughs> class this is World War one by the way like super treacherous super yeah and then you're like oh, oh yeah what you're you don't have the guts or you don't you're not brave enough yeah, for and then, this and then people people back in back in the safety of uh, call calling judgment on on guys that and that's the other thing is these guys almost every one of those guys they had fought for some certain amount of time they would yeah. fought for six months 12 months a year two years whatever <sighs> they had fought and fought and they broke years so yeah, man, it's awful. It's awful. Do. Um, but you know, I think it's something that it, if we can keep in perspective, because there's so much judging. Yeah, you know what I mean. People judge each other all the time. Yeah, it's like you know what? Take a wrap off your judgment. Yeah, that 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 was that was my that was sort of what I was thinking through the whole time. I was thinking about how often am I judging someone? Yeah, huh? you know, it's like well, yeah, you, you don't get to judge. You don't get to judge. You just you just do. You worry about you. Yeah. And hey, instead of trying to judge, why don't you try and help someone? Yeah. There's a novel idea. Instead of placing judgment on someone that's having a hard time with something, why don't you try and help them? Why don't you try and figure out how you can support them? Why don't you figure out what they need? Yeah. You just think if anyone had that attitude, one person would have stepped up and said, "Hey, look." I know this guy. He was a good guy. Let me g try and get him back in the game. Let me try and figure out what's wrong. Yeah. Instead of everyone jumping on board the judgment bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of seems like there. It's that feeling of like I'm over here, you're over there. Like, hey, I don't need that kind of help. So why should you? Kind of thing. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. Don't judge. Don't judge. All right. Well, instead of judging, help. How's that? That's your. That's my motto. Yeah. Instead of placing judgment, how about you help someone out? Support somebody. Support. I like what you just did there. <laughs> Speaking of which, how about let's go into some support? You know, support by yourself. The way, before you go to that, that opening poem by Wilfred Owen is freaking legit. Yeah. Freaking legit, and it's. I should read it again. I should have read it at the end or something. Mm. But go back and listen to it, because it's 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 a it's an incredible poem from yeah. a guy that went through all that. Yeah, he went into the the psychological ward, if it was called that. He went through the what would be would have been called a psychological ward at the time, and then he went back to the front, and yeah. then he was awarded for valor, and then he got killed, and he wrote that powerful powerful poem. It's freaking awesome. So, I had to throw that out there. Go back and listen to it. Yeah, totally. Well, support, if you will. Mm -hmm. Back to support. Mm -hmm. Back to support. 
back to support. Um, all right, here are some outstanding ways to support yourself and this podcast, if you're down for that. First, Origin. Okay, Origin is our company. I feel like it's everybody's company. It really? sort of is. Now? Well, our, it, well if, uh, let's say maybe now we can't include our international listeners on that. Yeah. We can definitely include our American listeners. <laughs> yes, if you're sir. an American listener, if you're here in the good old US of A, Origin is our company and you're including that. Yeah. and but, For sure. But I have been, you know, I've been hearing things that even people in the UK they're waiting. They're open arms. Yeah, when true. Again, true. when are we getting milk in the UK? When you know they're asking these questions. So open arms, boom. I think that it is. It is or soon to become everyone's company. Yeah, check. It's just the kind Worldwide. of company it is. Let's face it. Just because everything's made in America, which I'll go into, doesn't mean you have to be American to be true. Down for the cost. You could be. You could be down for just g- good treatment of the workers. Yeah. They're not in a sweatshop. No, they're actually in a in. They're actually on one one twenty five High Street. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know what a one twenty five is, but I dig That's it. That's the address. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe that was some sort of a term. No, you see what it I'm wasn't saying? some sort of a term. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yes, okay, uh, Origin. So, what do we got at Origin? Okay, if you're on the Jiu-Jitsu path, if you're on the path, and Jiu-Jitsu is part of your specific situation, mm-hmm. boom, you're going to need a gi. You're going to want a gi. You don't need a gi. You don't need anything. This is what you're going to want, big time, actually. You kind of need a gi. If you're going to train Jiu-Jitsu with a gi, you're going to need a gi. Well, yes, <laughs> that's There's true. no denying that. All right, well, here you go. So, you do but, need a gi. Uh, you know. Well, you don't need to train no gi jiu-jitsu but it is highly recommended in fact it is an affirmative you should train gi and no gi yes so i would personally agree with that gi no gi jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. both all everything so therefore we can conclude we do need a gi yes and if you're wondering what gi to get boom wonder no more origin has gis all made in america by the way but these are quality Quality geese made from scratch, by the way, by Origin for Jiu Jitsu mm-hmm. specifically. Anyway, best geese in the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of by far, too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. There's not much competition out there. Anyway, OriginMain.com. That's where you get them. Geese, rash guards. Uh, also, some other stuff, you know, some joggers, some sweatsuits, some shirts, you know, that kind of stuff. Apparel. Sweatsuits. Sweatsuits. I think it's we... funny when you, go, when you represent the full origin sweatsuit yeah, leisure bro. suit yes sir <laughs> yeah max oh, comfort Jack. max comfort experience it for yourself but yes all that stuff and good the, stuff you got your supplements too we got supplements uh origin and we got joint warfare for your joints we got krill oil which is for your joints and everything else and what else discipline the discipline the discipline gives you a little we'll say a little edge yeah edge. on the mats of jiu-jitsu and on the mats of life of life yes very much so <laughs> mental edge physical edge you know vitamins I, I, vitamins are specific but we'll say for lack of a better term vitamins for your brain I like for it. your okay. whole situation Check. actually and, and, yeah. and then you got mulk which is which is glorious it's a protein dessert Fortified. Here's the thing about okay. So, here's the thing about milk, which I found out. If I keep finding these things out here, I'm not the kind. Apparently, evidently, I'm not the kind of person who's like doing all the research. What are the benefits of this thing? Yeah. Apparently, I would. I thought I was that kind of person. You just you just started drinking it. But yeah, you're like, oh, milk. Yeah, I'm like, cool. I'll taste it. Boom, I taste it, and it tastes like super good. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. I'm in, and then you tend you start to become in the mood for some uh, milk shake. Mm. A milk shake, yeah. yeah. Milk shake, milk shake. And so I'll be like, yeah, I'm kind of, here's what I did do. I did this a bunch of times in a row. So I guess I do this. I make a peanut butter jelly sandwich (laughs) and a milk shake. Yeah. And I put some of the peanut butter in the milk. Uh, Okay. And that's the chocolate mint one. Yeah. Okay. And that's a weird thing. It is. But it still tastes good. It tastes really good. Wait, wait, what, what's weird? Peanut butter jelly sandwich. Peanut, Peanut butter and mint. Oh yeah, going together. No, see, and you'd think, yeah, sure, that is kind of odd. It's not odd. Okay. It's, it's well, you won't have to do that for much longer. Yeah. Because we got peanut butter mold coming out, so you can you can just be cool. 
<laughs> just chill with all that peanut butter <laughs> in the mint. It, to me, it's all good. Put it all, all in there. PB and J is coming at you strong, huh? You're just getting all up on the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> like you're like you're nine years old. I know, bro. Remember old school? That's the way to gain that weight. Was, that was, I don't remember that. I just remember, oh, what's for breakfast? What uh, PB yeah, and J? Lunch. What's for lunch? Yeah. PB and J. Yeah. Oh, we're going. Remember the little plastic Ziploc bag? <laughs> Actually, we didn't even so have Ziploc big. bags back in the day. They just had like a fold over flap. <laughs> There'd be jelly yeah. smeared all over that thing. Mom never put enough yeah. jelly on the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I know, no, man. never. It was all, <laughs> all, all. A bunch of peanut butter in there. Why is it cheaper? That costs the same thing. I, put more jelly on the sandwich, mom. Come on. Where are you at? <laughs> Get that sweetness going. What, what makes that funny is that that is 100% true. Oh, it's universal. Yeah, I think it's universal. I don't know what's up with the moms get taught at mom school. Lay yeah, off. No, they, they go, yeah. hey, you hold back was, on the jelly. No, you know what it was? No, think about it. When you buy, I mean, I don't know how much peanut butter you buy at the store and jelly, mm. but probably oh, as adults. Oh, the peanut butter things are small. I mean, the jelly things are a little bit smaller. They're smaller so and a little bit more expensive. Di- yeah. Yeah, and that okay. peanut butter thing is huge. Yeah. Well, potentially. I mean, you know, you yeah. got some the kids crunchy. or whatever. <laughs> Sure, <laughs> crunchy, creamy, whatever. Yeah. But you get the peanut, the huge peanut butter. You got the little jelly. With the jelly's mm-hmm. more expensive. Mom's trying to, you know, she's, she's trying, trying to, to be trying to save economical about the yeah. whole deal. She yeah. went to that Home Depot class, <laughs> that Home Economics class. Do you have Home Economics in high school? Yeah, you know, yeah. Made I had Home Economics in, in high school too. Yeah, bro, it's good. My my, uh, I think my little sister got kicked out of Home <laughs> Economics. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was funny. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, you didn't get k- kicked out. Uh, I definitely got in trouble a sure. couple times in home economics, but I but I didn't get kicked out. But my little sister got kicked out for what? Putting the butter knife in the toaster uh, or something like I that. I forget what she did. I'll I'll research that and get back with you. She was a she's a character, so you know that that home economics was a little tough on her. She's a character for some reason that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I don't know her, but you know. I know other members of your family. Check. Mulk. Yeah. <laughs> back to Mulk. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mulk, protein. Yeah. Added protein. Here's the thing. Okay. So back to my point. My point was I don't do all the research, you know. Yeah. So I start just pounding Mulk, get on the Mulk train, hardcore. And meanwhile, I'm discovering all these new things. <laughs> all right. I knew about the probiotics. Um, but now it's like I find out it's keto-friendly. It's, yeah. I mean, you unless know. you mix it with milk, because yes. I mix it with milk. I should make yeah. that clear. I mix it with milk. Yeah. Yeah. But so, you go like what? what like what's I, If you go, uh, like I said, if you mix it without milk, if you mix it with water, then you're talking ham sandwich level of goodness. Yeah, but there's like, it's like know, it's good. Like it's coconut, fine. like coconut, like, yeah, like you can get some coconut. coconut yeah, right? that's true. That's yeah. true. I haven't tried it actually. I will try it. And here's the thing too. And, you, and this, if, if you, Jocko, don't know that much about this part, it won't surprise me. There are so many milk like substitutes. Variants. Yeah. yeah. There's and a bunch of variants, milk variants and yeah. almond. Like lactose free. Lacto- yeah, there's stuff. like a lot. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot of options for that. Yeah. And when you're talking keto, that's a whole, you know, that's a th- that's a whole like dietary Thing. plan. Yeah. You know, so there are a lot of options. So nonetheless, regardless of what you mix it with. Have you mixed it with itself, any other kind of mul- milk? Yeah, that 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 um, almond milk? Almond milk. Yeah. Almond milk's not keto friendly, is it? I don't no, think it's not. I'm not, well, I'm not no. on You got to go coconut milk. You can yes. go coconut milk. Yeah. And you could get there. Yeah. And but, actually, but you got to get the real coconut milk. You yes. can't get the fake coconut. You can't get Correct. the you can't get the 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 the, the, hot, the milk that's the coconut milk that they're trying to sell you as like a health thing. Well, not yeah, not co- and like, oh, keep in mind my- <laughs> And they're dumping a bunch of sugar in there on the slide. <laughs> well, wait, are you talking about coconut water? Cuz there's a yeah, difference coconut between coconut water. Co- di- no, I'm, to- I'm not talking about. I'm talking about coconut milk. And milk, I know milk. the difference. Okay. I went, d- bro in Hawaii, we learned all about that in school. <laughs> the difference between ho- coconut milk and coconut water. All Come right. on, man. All right. Well, there you go. None, it, you but remember. you are right, though. You are right about the coconut milk. If you get the, you know, the unsweetened or yeah, the, yeah. the one, the, yeah. the, the, the real yeah. kind. Yeah, yeah, the real Straight one. Straight coconut milk. And that's keto, you're saying? Yes. Okay. So that's the one I mixed it with. It's got like time. 10 billion grams of fat in it. It's so <laughs> good. It, yeah. It's like uh, 98 grams of fat in a can mm. of coconut milk. Uh, Get some. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as keto goes, that's dope. You're good. Yeah. But we're talking about the milk itself, though. The milk is the powder. Yeah. So that's keto. So whatever you mix it with, True. that's going to be, you know, an extreme ownership situation. You know, if you want to stick with the keto, stick with the keto. 
milk is part of that yeah. that deal. You can't that do scenario. That. Check. Nonetheless, Check. good right. good clean protein, probiotics, all these things, and it tastes Ugh. good. And here's the thing: it's not like oh yeah, all these benefits. And then by the way, it tastes good. It's not that to me. <laughs> it tastes good. See, oh, and by the way, yeah, it has yeah. all this good. So stuff. you're now with me on the thing about thing the importance of things Bro. tasting good, or I should say the importance. <laughs> Of things tasting Importance. good, yeah, yes. You're you're with me that that is that is probably possibly the most important thing. Uh, bro, if you're gonna bring I'm something you. into your game like fully, yeah. If this is gonna become part of your life, if it doesn't taste good, it's not gonna become part of your life. Yeah. And if and if you bring something in, it, that's part of your life that tastes like crap, like how long are you gonna sustain that for, and why? When you can have something that delish. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't. You don't. Have to have that beef anymore? No, not for no this kind of stuff. That. But yeah, and that's the whole reason I like I did. Like I said, peanut butter jelly sandwich with the milk, right? Mm-hmm. And I put a little bit of peanut butter in it. Like I said, and I'm like, it is literally like a dessert. I'm like pounding it on the, on yeah. the thing. Anyway. It's really good. Nonetheless, yeah, milk very good. OriginMain.com. That's where you get these outstanding things. Also, Jujitsu Immersion Camp. Back to Jujitsu and Origin in and of itself. In we and have milk there at the origin camp. A lot of it. Yes. There's also jujitsu there. <coughs> Strangely enough, I know. Best way to learn jujitsu, most of the. Eh, I'm sure there are exceptions, but if you immerse yourself in any Thing. activity, that's a very, very effective and good way to learn. And there's a e- jujitsu immersion camp. Yep. August 26th through September 2nd this year. Bunch so that's of us coming are going. up. Yeah, a bunch of us are going, yeah. including some people that have never trained before. Wait, okay, so did we find out whether or not it's sold out? Because we're all not. talking. I about just checked it. the website and it's not sold out. Okay, so it's not sold out. I don't. It, it might be close, but go and sign up now. Yeah, and then we can go. And then yeah, well, that's the best way to find out if it's sold out. Go sign up. Yeah, if it says true. cool, you're signed up, you're solid. That means Worst not sold case, out. Worst case, bring a tent. <laughs> yep, that could lake tent get some as they say but yeah echo yeah. lake tent mosquitoes <laughs> yeah mosquitoes is there yes mosquitoes everywhere i guess well right? maine it's a state bird up there <laughs> 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 state bird. they used to they used to get yeah. me through my like jeans at night oh yeah, yeah. can you imagine a mosquito that's just so psycho it just like comes up jeans no factor i'm yeah. going right through those with a stinger yeah the <laughs> straight needle yeah that's the main ones yeah that's weird on Kauai. there's mosquitoes for sure they're not they're legit mosquitoes but i don't think maybe if you go in the mountains or something like yeah. that well they only have to bite through that lightweight hoodie so <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to be so hardcore no that's true that's true yeah. nonetheless emerging camp real good one a lot of people going man a lot of people l- legitimate people going beginners advanced yeah. everywhere dean list dean list that's an advanced guy obviously yeah Advance come and get some to say the least. Nonetheless, August twenty sixth is September second. Come and get it. Also, Jocko has a store. Mm-hmm. It's called Jocko Store. dot com. So Jocko Store. dot com. This is where you can get the shirts if you want to represent. You know, represent the 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 path that we are all on, if you will. Discipline equals freedom. Discipline equals freedom is the path, really. Uh, yes. Well, it's like freedom. It's like n- the path is discipline. No, actually, I don't, I don't know if that's right. Discipline equals freedom is the sort of like the road map. Yeah, right? the, but the path is like yeah, the path yeah, is yeah, actual. The path, the is, path is actually doing it. The, yeah, the discipline is the path. Yeah, and then freedom, freedom is, is like the, the, result, the, the the destination where you're continually trying to go. Yeah, but you're the you're just existing in this fabric of freedom because of the discipline. True. Hey, however you want to put it, deep, bro. if you want to represent. Go to JockoStore.com. You can get shirts, rash guards, hoodies, hats, and beanies and whatnot. T-shirts. Did you say T-shirts? T-shirts on there. Yeah. Trucker hats. Tank tops even. It's getting warm, man. Wait. It's been warm. Male tank tops? Male tank tops. Oh, I'm going to place the order. All right. There you go. Oh, that's that's good. Do it. But yeah, man, if you want to represent. Is, are they, because are they, uh, you know I'm not super uh, fashion aware. Yes, I do know that. Yeah. <laughs> are tank tops... Out in or out of style, because tank tops are the reason in I, style. The reason I ask this is because, first of all, I wear the same clothes forever. Yes, I and I wear that. them until they're completely destroyed. Well, I had when I met my wife, I had a bunch of tank tops. 
Mm. Like that was sort of like my go-to. I just wore them all the time because it's yeah. hot, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't wear them all the time, but anytime the temperature, anytime in the summertime, anytime. I wore yeah, basically yeah, yeah. warm all the time. Functional. And gotcha. then one day, my wife, because they were all old and ratty and they had Guinness stains on them and they were just all jacked <laughs> sure. up, but I didn't care. Of course. Because yeah. of whatever. Yeah. And my wife threw every single one of them away. Yeah. Like, Every yeah. single one of them away. Like, just... And and the thing is, in her mind, it wasn't spiteful. Yeah. She was actually, like, Makes super sense. stoked. Like, oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, you know how those old uh, ugly shirts... Yeah, I, uh, the dirty shirts, I, I threw them all away, so you just have <laughs> clean shirts now. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. You know, she's coming at me with, you're welcome. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, these were all, like, my favorite. They were all super... You know, you know a shirt that's, like, 14 years old is super comfy? Yeah, I know you're, the you're, idea. You're the, you're the comfort dude. Comfort kind of story. Come on, a t-shirt that's 20 years old is more comfortable than a t-shirt that's brand new, correct? Yes. Okay, so I had a whole series of tank tops like that, all super comfortable. <laughs> my wife threw them all dang, away. Dang, bro. I've been complaining. The, the one thing is my wife complains about me is that when something happens, yeah. Like this, yeah. I hold it against her forever. Yeah. I still will bring it up. I I'll, like, it, like you know, it's been hot lately. Yes, you know, the them are like, oh, she's like, I can't believe how hot it is. I mean, like, it'd be nice if I had some tank tops, but yeah. <laughs> throw them all away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somebody threw them away. <laughs> so okay, tank tops. Yeah, I need to go order some. There you of those. go. Yeah, back in the game with the tank tops coming at you. <laughs> to answer your question, are tank tops? What yeah. do you say in fashion? Yeah, because I, when I think tank tops, I also think like '80s dude, right? Sure. Which is pretty much what I was, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, probably yeah, yeah. still sure. am. But yeah. I'm just throwing like a question out there to make sure I'm not out of line with it. With yeah. the, you know what though? I think tank tops. Like, remember them pants that I forget what they were called, but like the bodybuilders wore those pants that were kind of like an elastic yeah. waist, and they kind of yes. like yes. were printed. Yeah, and all wacky. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I don't want if that's the equivalent right now. May, I don't know if we're yeah. gonna roll out like that. All right, yeah, I, yeah, you know what I mean? Not, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. If those things were mean. functional, I'd, I mean, if those but, pants were like functional, but they were super not functional. Yeah, I don't. I mean, functional for what? What I wonder what those Lifting? pants were called. What do you think they were actually called? Do you think they had a name? Yeah, I think so. I don't know what they're called. I, I know, and this is a different type of pants, but you remember the MC Hammer pants? Well, yeah, those are slightly different, different. similar. Yeah. But yeah, the, the bodybuilding ones with the print on them. Yeah, they're kind of wide. They're kind of <laughs> balloony. Yeah, balloony, but tight at the ankles. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're tapered. <laughs> I actually never had a pair of those. <laughs> no. but thank God. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, though. that's the kind of thing where it's like a picture of that surfaces on the internet, and you're all like, damn. Yeah, that's old school. Yeah. It's retro, actually. You know how they bring it <laughs> also, back. Also, maybe it's coming back. Maybe. Maybe, maybe I, you could I don't bring know. it back. Yeah, maybe. All right. What else? No, no, no. Tank tops, though, they're in. Okay, cool. they'll They'll never go out because yeah, tank yeah. tops is too they're, broad they're of a thing. They're functional thing, too. Yeah. They're functional. They're, like, cooler. They're, yeah. they're not, like, not as hot. Yes. So we're down with them. I agree. So, boom, we got that. Get on it if you want to represent jockostore.com. So we do it. Women's stuff on there, too, by the way. If it, actually, I haven't said that already, but can't overstate it. Something well, for actually, everybody. You, you actually can overstate a yeah, lot I'm, of things. You're right. <laughs> that's <Yes>. cool. Put <laughs> down. You're right. You're that's, right sort of like, that's sort of like part of your thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, tank tops and overstating stuff. <laughs> 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 uh, All right. Shit. There you go. What about subscribe? How about subscribe? How about that? Let's let you, we'll shift yep. gears here. Great way to support is just simply to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yeah. already. And then leave a review so yeah. I can read your funny review. Oh, you're f smart and intellectual review, but you might want to leave a funny one. And also the Warrior Kid podcast. Yes, good one. Regardless of who you, if you're, if you have any relationship to kids on any even semi continual basis, Warrior Kid pos podcast very beneficial. Yeah. I press record and listen to it, and I personally bring the lessons home. I do too. I'm digging the, on the, and we're getting great feedback. Yeah, people are digging it. Yeah, I'm and digging it. You're digging it. Good one for teachers too. Yeah, which is you know obviously that fits the category yeah, of having sure. a relationship with kids. Also YouTube, uh, you can get Warrior Kid videos on YouTube, and you can get the Jocko podcast videos on YouTube. And Echo's actually been you know, stepping up his game big time. Semi active, yeah. Semi active. I guess that's a step up. <laughs> <laughs> get your semi active on, and he makes not only the videos of this podcast, but he also makes. Uh, enhanced ones with lots of graphics you need to let him know sometimes maybe he's brushing up against going too crazy yeah. right yes it's we've been talking about it yeah if if too many things explode I mean let's face it 
<laughs> There's a lot of movies out there. What are those movies? Uh, what, movies? No, but what's like the what's the what's the most the best one? Commando. Okay, so there, Commando has just no. You got to go with a more modern one where there's more CGI and just everything's blown up. Oh, uh, dang! I watched know. one the other day with my nine year old daughter. Everything blew up. Everything was on fire. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was starting to seem like it was one of your videos. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, there you go. There you go. Uh, you got that new tool. What tool? The only, the only video that I think is truly brushed up against that you've made. Yes. I don't think it crossed the line. Okay. But the Warpath video, okay. you were brushing up against everything that I did exploded and turned to dust and right. caught on fire. You, you were on the Warpath. Yeah, you were on the Warpath point. in that's the video. Point. It was thematic. Yeah, yeah, and it happened to be Christmas time at the time yeah, well, for that, the that original video one. Got kanked. <laughs> no, but it's still on there. So there's that. Nonetheless, yeah, you can. Those are all on YouTube. Yes, dance videos. Also, when we're working out, just got rings. I told you that. Yeah, they just came in. Boom, really nice ones too. You can't do Can, muscle ups though, cause your arm. Not right now, no. But here's the thing, bro. I never got into muscle ups. That's wrong. So I've attempted muscle ups, and I've seen that there's a technique to muscle ups. Like it's it certainly not like, is. Yeah. yeah. So like I've never grip. had the pleasure of doing a muscle up ever. Mm. Never done a muscle up. Rings, bar, nothing. Mm. So when my arm heals. Fully, You're when I'm going capable, the up I'm, f- I'm doing muscle up. That's, that's my whole right going to be one of my things. Okay. Also, a pistol squat. Okay, so I've done pistol squats before. Mm. Really hard, really clunky, really ugly, mm-hmm. even. But did I call a, you out on that one day? Uh, In no. like while we were doing the podcast, like after the podcast or something, I was like, "Ooh, pistol!" And then, oh, and then I was like, "Well, let's get." Yeah, are you fl- wait, are, you're not as flexible, are you? No, no, no. I am. Remember, you were like, you were like, "Damn, you're flexible." Oh, okay. In my knees and my ankle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We well, you, you got a lot of room to move around in the knees. <laughs> yeah, you, you think you're so just funny. Say it. Just, yeah, just yeah, say it. the so, knees, you know, they got room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just so so side splittingly funny. <laughs> anyway, very flexible. I'm going to do pistol squats and muscle ups. Watch. And be really good at it. Nonetheless, oh, my check. point is, I got my rings. Anyway, my actually my point is, we're talking about on it. So you go to onit.com slash Jocko. This is where I have been getting outstanding workout gear that deviates from my normal dumbbells. Mm. You know, whatever. So that's check. how I got turned on to kettlebells. All this good stuff. They have some good stuff. The bag, you know, like the, I don't think it's a Bulgarian bag. You know what a Bulgarian bag is, right? I have a Bulgarian bag. Okay. And I have the big sandbag thing from on it. Okay. So how big is your sandbag? Bigger than yours. I don't have one. Oh, okay. No, I don't know. No, the one, there's just one size, I think, from on it. Okay. Yeah. But then you can, you fill it up, right? Yeah, you can put different amounts of sand on it. Okay. How much does yours For sure. I have no idea. No, 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 go ahead, weigh it, tell me. So okay. Just yeah. so I can fill up more. Put an extra pound in there. Cool. Bro, I've been doing that, um, the farmer's carry yeah. thing. I've been do- I mean, my arm can't sustain too much weight, yeah. but, bro, it's it's solid. Yeah. It's a solid little I go workout. around, the, I, if I went around the block the other day with my 106s. Two of them. Yeah. One in, one in each hand. Yeah. And, like, I was like, okay, you know, it's it's definitely challenging. Yeah, I mean, it hard. takes, it, and I have to set them down a couple times during that lap Mm -hmm. but what i noticed was the next day like my entire my entire like traps neck Neck. shoulders everything and forearms were all sore yeah so i knew i i had that in the routine i was doing it pretty regular Mm -hmm. because i like to see how far i can get each time but anyways it's yeah it's really good just for your body like strength how far is your block i don't know more than well, a block is about what? You can't say yards? that because the blocks are all yeah, different sizes. Yeah, I'm thinking like city block, downtown, San Diego specific. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. different, way Check. different. Nonetheless, anyway, onit.com slash Jocko. Right. Really cool stuff on there. Cool info as well. Don't You can get stuck on that website because there's a lot of cool stuff on there. Also, anyway. Psychological Warfare, it's an album with tracks. A, a lot of people ask for uh, an alarm system. This is kind of an alarm that you can put in your phone, and it's me talking about times that you might want to slack off yeah. this will not allow any slack psychological warfare it's on itunes google play etc check it's a good one dang that was pretty concise yeah and effective because that that is what it is also jocko white tea yeah i got so the tea 
I'm into the cans, not into the brewing. JP, one. sorry, bro. J- I think JP might have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> JP's all about yeah. it. Actually, okay. All so about, let me ask you this: It has a little bit of caffeine. And what's good is that JP, JP, my brother, that boy can drink some dang energy drinks <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. yeah. Like like where I should have as a friend been like, hey JP, I need to talk to you. I need <laughs> to send you to rehab. Yeah. We need to get you off these things. The Cause he would pound that stuff. You know, yeah. cause he's going hard, man. He's he's you know, JP's getting after it. Yeah. And so it's like, oh okay, cool. I'll just drink nine <laughs> energy drinks. And well, so now he's on. He's drinking Jocko white tea, and uh, so that's real positive. It's a good replacement for that crap. He's just pounding them. Yeah, yeah. I. But he's calling this. me like a crackhead. Like, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got another two cases. By the way, can't. Yeah, Can you give it to little kid? Like, ba- not mm, babies. There's caffeine in it, bro. That yeah, that's I what I thought. I don't think you can give it to little kids. Yeah, because my son grabs grab. What's a deadlift? <laughs> <laughs> he does lift though. Or he tries yeah, to yeah, anyway. Sure. He's a little kid. Nonetheless, yes, very good. Ooh, another thing that happens to taste really, really good from Jocko. Jocko's into the whole tasting good thing. Nonetheless, Jocko White tea, really good one. Um organic, certified. Yeah. By the way. So get down yeah, with it. Yeah. Good. That's a, good way to support. You know what? Right now it's on Amazon. And we're gonna expand that. We got it in Canada. It's on Jocko's store too, by the way. I wanna say Australia. Getting some Jocko tea in Australia. We're gonna go England. So, anyways, well, the store ships everywhere. Look, I are the shipping yeah, from the store. I hate is, when people. I hate when people say like, "Hey, man, what's up with your shipping?" It's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I I don't. I'd rather you just don't buy it. You know, uh, you yeah. want to buy it, whatever. Wait till we get it to your country. Yeah, well, but we have it in your country. We got it in Canada. We got it in England. We got it in Australia. Yeah, Jocko White tea. Well, here's the thing: the shipping from the shipping from the store can get challenging because we're paying what they're kind of charging us for the. It's like a whole thing, and uh, we're working on just slowly and slowly yeah. getting the shipping oh, more. You know, and plus the, the 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 bigger we get, yes. then we get the economy of scales. Yes, and so that's can make stuff cheaper yeah. too. So I appreciate but that support some, while we're on our way, because one day you're gonna be able to buy Jocko White tea everywhere you go. Yeah. It might just be coming out of your drinking fountain too. <laughs> just like, oh yeah, sure. this chocolate white tea. Yeah, yeah. That way everyone's getting stronger. Sink. Uh, but- yep. Yeah, I wrote some books. One of them's called "Way of the Warrior Kid." One of them is a follow-up of that book series called "Way of the Warrior Kid: Mark's Mission." Those books will help your kid. I promise. How's that? Yeah. Should I do that? I th- yeah. I, I, I think, think I should. I think you I think should I can. do that. Yes. I, I've got. I've not had anyone. Say, hey, my kid read that book and didn't like it and has now said that they want to get weaker. Yeah. That has not happened yet. Hey, this does not help. Yeah. So, Way the Warrior Kid books, get them for whoever. Whatever kid you know, whatever family, get them for your library, get them for whoever. It's like like a good way to help, man. It's a good way to help. Also got a book called Discipline Equals Freedom, Field Mail. I, just read, I saw someone just wrote on Twitter that that's the best book they've ever read. Dang. Now, I have no frame of reference. It might be the only book he's ever read. But Nonetheless. I will say this. The Field Manual, if you crack that thing open and you take a little look, it'll it'll reset your your your, your compass a little bit. Yeah. It really will. It resets yeah. my I wrote the book, and I still get my <laughs> compass reset when I look at it. There you go. So it's a good book, too, to get for people that are sort of like maybe they're a little bit they, they're they're somewhere right yeah they're not really going in the right direction or they're not going the right direction as, as hard as they should be boom yeah it doesn't matter you're someone that's like completely off the path like on the slippery slope you're in the in the what was that place you called one time like the the weeds yeah, no, no, it wasn't yeah, the weeds. Weed you, 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 someone from a movie that you saw, which is a lot of movies. <laughs> Some s- place of misery. Swamps, swamps of, of sadness, yes. You're in the swamps. Maybe someone in the swamps is right. Get him the book. But you get someone that's like not in the swamp, but that's actually on the path. They want to get further on the path. Get him that book right there. I really like how you use swamps of sadness. Yeah, that, that makes me feel very Using good. references via you. So that's <laughs> Discipline Equals Freedom, the field manual. It's not a normal book. No. It's, no, good. it's not a normal book. Uh, Extreme Ownership. That's the first book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. And that book is about leadership. It's about the combat leadership principles we learned on the battlefield 
and how you can apply them to everything that you do. Now, we got a follow up book to that called The Dichotomy of Leadership. The follow up book to that is actually chapter 12 of Extreme Ownership talks about the dichotomy of leadership, and that's balancing these opposing forces. And we realized through Echelon Front, our consulting company, that the biggest problem people have is that they have a hard time staying balanced as a leader. So we wrote a whole book about it so that people can dial in and get granular, and that's the dichotomy of leadership. We're getting awesome feedback on it. We're better writers now than we were then. I mean, seriously, sure. it's been three it. years. I've been reading and writing up nonstop, mm-hmm. and so we're better. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's that. <clears throat> that comes out September 25th. If you want the first dish, you got to order it now. Mm. Someone said that they're ordering it now so that they get the first dish so that when they meet me and I sign it They're not like holding their head down in shame <laughs> Someone else said hey, yep. oh, I guess I'm a bad guy cuz I gave away my first dish of of extreme ownership mm. You're not a bad guy. Mm. You just made a mistake <laughs> Get somebody else yep. the third dish the fifth dish. You don't care mm. about that. There's only one dish You only get one crack at the title or they're very very noble. You know how many copies of extreme of of about face? I have oh, I'm gonna count them. I don't know, but I got a lot No kidding. always in the hunt for that first dish got uh-huh. a couple of them gotcha, gotcha. so Anyways, that's that Also, I just mentioned Echelon Front, that is our leadership and management consulting company. It's me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke, Flynn Cochran, and also Mike Sorelli, who is just on the podcast 134. Awesome podcast. Awesome to talk to Mike. Awesome to be working with Mike again. And what we do is we solve problems through leadership, period. That's what we do. Muster 006 in San Francisco, California, October 17th and 18th. It's gonna sell out. Hey, we're getting close, but um, yeah, register at extremeownership.com. Every muster we've done has sold out. This is the sixth one. Also, this is an important one for current military, law enforcement, border patrol, firefighters, paramedics, every all you first responders out there. We got a one day leadership seminar in Texas, Dallas, Texas, September twenty first. We did this because we want to do something shorter and focused so that more people in uniform could get to it and it's a cheaper price point than the muster so if you're in, in one of those types of organizations come to the roll call and it but it is a muster it's a mini muster would you say well, that it's not really a mini muster it's a it's it's they're both leadership training right but this one is completely focused on these dynamic environments yeah. whereas the muster is talking about it talks about a broader leadership leadership a little bit broader not so focused gotcha. I shouldn't say not so focused it's it, this one is specific it's yeah, to it's specific. the dynamic yeah. environments yeah fully and we can focus a little bit more on it the challenges are we can address the challenges that those leaders have in those dynamic environments as opposed to the muster where we address that one is is definitely the muster is more focused on business leadership even though we get all types of leaders and we do get military and law enforcement there it's focused on Business leadership more this one we focus and like and I just got back. I mean, it's worked with uh, uh, the Arizona Highway Patrol and just mm-hmm. being out there You know you just you you hear that it's leadership and the better you are as a leader The better your team's gonna be the more prepared you're gonna be for bad situations and we you know echelon front does this we work with fire departments we work with police departments and we know that not every department can bring us in so that's why we do this that's why we decided to do this roll call so people could come to it and get the training concentrated one day so they're better prepared to do their jobs on the beat on the battlefield wherever they are Mm. all right and and lastly we have the overwatch ef overwatch which is where we are connecting special operations vets combat aviation vets with companies that need solid leaders you can go to efoverwatch.com to get in the game on that and if you want to spend some time with us virtually virtually in the virtual world sure. until we see each other live at the muster in San Francisco or we see each other live at the roll call in Texas or live at the immersion camp in Maine then you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, and of course on that face. 
Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And as always, to those of you out there in uniform that are protecting us here and abroad, that's the military, law enforcement, firefighters, border patrol, paramedics, other first responders, without you, the world falls apart. So thank you for what you do, and thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to everyone for supporting. I know that this podcast is not always the most uplifting thing to listen to. I I know it gets heavy. I know it gets dark, just like life does. But I definitely don't want you to dwell in the darkness. I don't dwell there. But as I've said before, I do think that we need to know the darkness so that we can steer our lives in the right direction away from it toward the good and toward the light. So go out there, don't be judgmental, go out there and fight against the darkness by doing what you should be doing, what you know you should be doing, by doing good, by being good, and of course, by getting after it. Until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.